Hi everyone, welcome to the Tambrellas webinar. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to do a brief introduction and then I'll introduce our speakers who will do the talk and then we'll have an, a question and answer session. But throughout the talk, feel free, if you have a question, leave it in the chat. You don't have to wait till we ask for questions so that you don't forget them. And we also have enough time to answer all your questions. Uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel in the next 24 to 48 hours. So a little bit about umbrella, that umbrella. We are a community of underrepresented persons in data science and we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, the umbrella is run by a team of volunteers and here we have Reshma who's uh, a statistician and data scientist and you can find her on Twitter, LinkedIn and GitHub at Reshma S. I'm Beryl Canali. I'm a data scientist. You can find me on Twitter at Beryl Canali. We have a code of conduct and we thank you for helping uh, make the Tambrella friendly community for all. Uh, how you can support us. One is by following a code of conduct so that everyone can feel uh, can feel welcome and they can come back to our webinars. And another way you can support us is uh, by joining our Discord community chat where you can ask and answer general questions there, share events, jobs, and other relevant uh, material. You can also donate to our nonprofit. We are on Open Collective as Data Umbrella, and we are also on Benevity, which is a company match enabled platform. We also have a YouTube channel where we have posted all our video to our events. So you can subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can get alerts whenever we post videos. Uh, on our YouTube channel, we have different playlists. Uh, for example, we have a playlist on career advice, uh, data visualization, contributing to open source, uh, and data science for beginners. We also have a monthly newsletter on Substack. You can uh, subscribe to our monthly newsletter. We release a newsletter once a month, and we promise not to spam you. Uh, we have an website at uh, umbrella.org where we have resources. You can find uh, resources to list of conferences, open source, burnout, AI ethics, accessibility and responsibility, and more. Uh, we are on all social media platforms as the Umbrella. Uh, Meetup is where we'll find uh, links uh, to our upcoming events. We always host um, at least two events per month. So feel free to um, join our meetup and uh, get alerts when we post an event. We also have a job board uh, on our website where we post available jobs in relation to data science, AI, and machine learning. We also have a GitHub account. Uh, you can follow us there. Uh, this event has a live captioning at the top of your screen on your right. Uh, there's a button CC. You can click on that if you need uh, to use uh, live captioning during the event. We also have a call for volunteers. Uh, we always do timestamps uh, uh, for all our videos so that they are easily accessible to folks who are looking for information. So you can do that. For example, if this video is, will be of interest to you, you can join us on GitHub and there'll be instruction on how you can uh, contribute to our timestamps. You don't have to do all the timestamps if the video is long, whatever you can do will go a long way in helping uh, the information on this video reach as many people as it can. We also have introduced a feedback form. Uh, this will help Edit Umbrella better. So you can uh, leave feedback. The feedback form is in the handouts. There's a link to it there. You can fill in the feedback form anonymously. So the feedback form will help us uh, get feedback on this event. In case you have any technical issues, you can also tell us there suggestions to future event topics and general feedback on the umbrella. Uh, we have uh, two upcoming events in January. One will be on Pandas, that is on January 10th. And on January 23rd, we'll have a Google Summer of Code panel discussion uh, for anyone who's interested in applying for Google Summer of Code uh, in 2023. Uh, so to today's talk, our topic today is learn your first, uh, your first job in data science. And our speakers are Wendy and Stacy. 
Uh, so a little bit about Stacy is a data professional working in big tech. And she, as someone who transitioned into tech, she first handles the difficulty that can come on trying to break into tech. Aside from her primary job, she also acts as a part-time teaching assistant for free data program training and guiding others uh, seeking to learn their first tech role. You can find her on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, we have shared these slides and the handouts. You can uh, click on these links and follow them on social media. Our second speaker is Wendy. Uh, Wendy has worked in data analytics in tech and biotech for over 10 years. Her favorite parts of working in data are data quality, data catalogs, and deep dive analysis. Uh, prior to industry, she was in research and, an academ and academia. She has also been an organizer of Pi Ladies Seattle since 2014. And she has also participated in mentoring uh, programs through Pi Ladies, Women in Analytics, and other programs. She is previously represented at, presented at Pi Data Seattle, Pi Con US, Pi Data LA, Women in Data Science, and Data Mishap's Night. You can also find her on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, you'll find her links in the handout section where our slides are. And with that, I will now introduce, uh, we'll let our speakers now take on from here. And as I mentioned, any question that crosses your mind, leave them in the question and answer tab. You don't have to wait uh, till we ask for questions. So Wendy and Stacy, you can now uh, start. Well, welcome everyone. Excited to be here while our slides get loaded here. Great. Um, so before we get started, I think uh, this quote really sort of sets the tone of, of our conversation today. And, and it just reads, the one thing that you have that nobody else has is you, your voice, your mind, your story, your vision. So write and draw and build and play and dance and live as only you can. Hi, so um, I'm Wendy Groos, and I'm a, a data scientist at Snowflake, and I'm Stacy Williams, and I currently work in big tech as a data professional. And we're here to um, give you some information and some support and some things to think about when you're trying to land your first job in data science. So the, the journey to becoming a, to land your first job at data science is a very independent one, but it largely depends on sort of five unique things. One is your starting point, um, whether you start as a, a new grad, you're early in your career, or you're a career transitioner. Um, the relevant skills you have, both your hard and soft skills. What is the current knowledge you have, your domain expertise? And then how are you going about your job targets? What companies are you looking at? How are you networking? And then lastly, the interview process, which is a two-sided process. So you might be wondering why, who we are and why we want to give this talk. Um, so like Beryl mentioned, I am a data scientist. I've been working as a full-time data professional for 10-ish years. Before that, I worked in research and academia. So I've been working with data for like 20 years. I'm also an organizer of Pi Lady Seattle, where I get to meet a lot of people at different stages of their career, including a lot of folks that are just trying to break into um, into their career. And I really enjoy the um, the aspects of you know trying to guide folks through that and um, answering different questions and um, the the satisfaction and fulfillment when um, when someone I know lands their first job. Yeah, and I'm Stacy. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum from Wendy. Um, I'm just about to enter my third year as a full-time data professional. I was a career transitioner, um, so I was doing something else prior to entering the world of data. Um, but more importantly, I think the steps that we'll outline are the exact steps that I followed to land my first role in data science. But we were once like you, and we needed to land our first job in data science. So this was my journey when I needed to go get a um, my first job in data data science. Um, my starting point was, like I said, I came from a background in academic research, and I was a scientist at a bioinformatics startup because um, I had studied genomics. Um, the the startup went out of business, and so I was going to find a new job. Um, I had some relevant skills from working in industry, um, so I knew how to do data analysis and data quality. I knew about working with customers because um, I had got to do that at the startup. 
And I knew about giving technical feedback to our software engineers about the products that our company made. Um, so the knowledge I had when I was trying to get my first data job was some SQL and some Python that I had learned on the job. I came to, to that position, you know, because of my genomics background, but I was able to acquire some, some of these more technical skills on the job. And then I had some genomics and genetics domain knowledge, but I wasn't particularly interested in um, just focusing on a job that required those skills. Uh, to, to target my jobs, I, I leaned a lot on networking and I was part of the Pi Ladies meetup group. And so um, I, I talked a lot with the other folks in the meetup group um, about like what types of jobs, uh, what companies should I look at in Seattle and that sort of thing. And I also looked a lot at internet job ads, which um, we'll go into a little bit more um, later on. Um, for my interviewing strategy, like I have really bad social anxiety related to interviewing. And so the main thing I was concerned with during interviews is how comfortable do I feel with these with these people that are interviewing me? Um, will I feel comfortable when I need to work with them? And do do I feel comfortable talking to them in a room for 30 minutes? Um, that was my main goal during this um, first data, uh, when I was getting my first data job. And um, all these with the goal of getting a job in industry. So I definitely wanted to work at a company. I really liked the customer aspect of my startup experience. So I wanted to make sure there were customers where I went. And I wanted to use these SQL and Python skills that I had learned to analyze data. Um, but since that first job, you know, I've been a part of the Pi Ladies community. I've been a part of other Seattle women tech groups and other West Coast Python groups um, and really learned about um, how to, 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 to talk more to folks and how to, um, um, how to speak about what I'm doing, how to answer questions from other people um, in those communities. Um, I've grown my career. I've moved to other companies, I've gotten promotions within companies, and I've been part of mentorship groups through PyLadies, Women Analytics, um, and, and like at work and things like that. And so for me, my starting point, my journey looked a little different. Um, my starting point was I had a technical degree. I have an undergraduate degree in engineering, although I had never worked as an engineer. Um, and I was a career transitioner, but I had data exposure. So while I wasn't directly a data professional, I was able to work around a lot of data professionals and sort of understand a little bit about the work that they did. Um, the hard skills that I came in with was C++ was what I learned in my undergraduate career. I taught myself SQL, and so I had also had exposure to data management systems and databases. From a soft skill perspective, communication, leadership, and so problem solving were three skills that were sort of part of my strong suit. Um, I had domain knowledge primarily in the media space. And how I sort of went about my job targets was I had the list of dream companies that I wanted to work at, um, but I really focused on companies and places where I had warm contacts or doing what I like to call sort of warming up cold contacts, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, when it came to interviewing, I focused primarily on sort of work-life balance, um, also diversity and representation, and then also making sure that the role that I landed was going to sort of compensate me based on market rate. Um, and then my ultimate goal was to land a job with the title of data scientist at a company with name recognition. I had come from some of my previous working experience where at smaller companies that weren't often well recognized. And so I wanted to really be able to work for a company where it didn't, I didn't have to explain what the company was or what they did. And so since then, I've been able to do a couple things. One is become a lifelong learner. Um, I don't think your learning journey should stop or does stop once you land your first job. And so I continue to take online courses, um, many of them free, some paid. Um, I've been able to deeper dive into passion projects and topics. And for me, that includes sports analytics. Um, and in terms of my career, I have since switched and now moved on to my second company, uh, which has allowed me to, to develop new skills, things that I necessarily didn't think I would get a chance to use like JavaScript. I've also been able to pursue stretched opportunities. And so obviously being able to take on certain things like product management tasks and things like that is something that I've since been able to do. And then also giving back. Um, I work as a, a TA at the online data program that I, I went through and also like to do my best to provide guidance and feedback for those who are sort of on their own journeys. And then being able to participate in events like this is something that I've gotten an opportunity to do as well. 
So now you've heard our starting points. And so when you're um, starting your um, journey to your first data science job, you want to think about your starting point and where are you coming from? So we see that there's um, like three common kind of starting points uh, for folks that are looking for their new for a new, their first job in data science. So one could be a new grad. Um, so you could be coming straight from an undergrad or graduate um, program that is related to data science. Um, and if, if that's the, your starting point, then you really want to like leverage the projects that you've worked on in your courses. And I want to focus like on the projects and like how you use the skills that you acquired in the courses and not just say, I learned this skill in this class. You want to say that you can apply that particular skill um, to a data set and explain the results and maybe work with people on that project. You also have the um, have the ability to leverage your alumni network either um, by you know saying, oh, I'm interested in going into data science. Is anybody here a data scientist? Or um, or sometimes they they might so people in your alumni network might post. Uh, data science jobs, um, and these are like um, like in like Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups or those kind of places. And also, if you're coming from a from a graduate program or an undergraduate program, you might have had the experience of internships, um, and definitely leverage that as you know that is real world experience that you have had, and you can say you've worked in a. In a, in a real world setting and not just in a classroom setting. And also don't forget about the contacts that you've met at those internships. A lot of times those do lead to full-time positions, but even if they don't, um, don't be afraid to go back and talk to those folks and they might know someone, someone somewhere else. Yeah, and then there's also the early career person. And so this is a person who is done with school and they've started their career and they've probably been working maybe a couple of years. Um, and then they decide that they want to work now in a more data focused role. Um, remember to build off of the existing skills that you developed. Even if you didn't work in a data role, those skills are still valuable. Um, the big question to ask yourself here is, is there a way to include data work into what you're already doing? So if you work in marketing, as an example, is there a way to be able to incorporate maybe some analytics into the marketing campaign? that you're working on and understand how from an analytical and data standpoint, those campaigns are actually running and performing. Then there's also the career transitioner. And this is a person who has worked for a number of years, maybe greater than five to eight years in a given career that's unrelated to data and they wanna make the transition. They could come from an academia background. Maybe they come from a non-technical background or even technical roles like software engineering. And now they wanna make the transition to data. It's important to remember that your experience matters. While you may be looking to sort of become new in the field of data, you're not new at all in your career. And what you did in those other fields is relevant. And the key then becomes being able to sort of help um, your potential new interviewers see the through line between what you did previously and the new role that you want to now get. So now we're going to go through all, um, what are the relevant skills that you might uh, that you already have and how are those related to to the goal that that you set on your first on your journey to your first data science job so let's talk a little bit about soft skills so soft skills are really your social ability they speak to sort of how well you relate to and interact with other people um, some common soft skills are interpersonal communication leadership and time management and while these skills are often thought about the least they actually actually show up well before we actually think about actually showing actually using them and then your the hard skills are more of like the technical skills so these are ones that you know there might be a test to to say do you know this skill um but again like stacy said it's not the only thing that you're going to need to to land your first job you definitely will need these hard skills to get a job but <clears throat> knowing the hard skills will not get you a job um, so these include like either Python or R um, as a scripting language, SQL to access data, some sort of visualization, um, whether that's like within Python or R or like some kind of BI tool. And then you're probably also going to need to know um, Git as well. Um, and that's for m how much you need to know and how proficient you need to be in those really depends on the job, but you probably need to have some familiarity with all of those. And then depending on the job, you might need to know other more specialized 
um, types of skills. So if you're very interested in like natural language processing, there are specific libraries that are related to natural language processing. And that might even require like taking more courses or having a specialized degree related to natural language processing. Similar uh, is like computer vision or other more specific types of machine learning. And then there might be like specific business domains that require um, require specific knowledge. So like marketing. So if you're really interested in becoming a data scientist in marketing, you probably will need to have some exposure to like email campaigns, click through rates, all that good stuff. Um, so like finance might also have its own special specific um, data science focus that you might need more exposure than just knowing those Python SQL data viz and Git. So how do you develop these set of soft skills? Um, one, one critical way is actually working collaboratively and in groups. Um, this can sort of force you to use these skills and to develop these skills. Another way is actually leading in other capacities outside of what you do from a professional standpoint. And so learning how to lead well in one area can often translate well to other aspects, including the job that you're hoping to land. And then a third step that's often overlooked is asking for feedback. Um, oftentimes, other people can sort of spot things that we are strong in or not as strong in and provide valuable feedback. And so soliciting feedback from those around you, whether it's people that you work for, or even your peers can be go a long way in sort of helping to you to develop these soft skills. And often, and again, remember that these are often on display long before you actually realize it. So things like how you're communicating, how quickly and effectively you're responding to communications, the language that you use in um, written communications with people are often signs of your soft skills, even before you realize you're actually using them. And for hard skills, there's pretty, there's kind of like two different paths to acquire these soft skills. So one could be like more structured learning. Um, so you're taking a course, you're enrolled in a program, you're enrolled in a boot camp, and um, and that's great. Like if you need structure, if you need accountability, if you need, you know, someone to outline the projects that you want to work on, uh, if you want to have other people that are going through it at the same time as you that you can lean on, like as your your cohort in this program, um, I think that's a that's a great way. Um, you definitely want to think about. Uh, if you're going to spend money, like what are you going to get out of it? So evaluate the programs beforehand, understand their outcomes, understand the, the benefits of them. Like if you are really interested in having like strong uh, set of coursework, you know, you want to go somewhere um, where that's important. If you want to go somewhere that has a strong alumni network, you you should ask about you know the alumni network and how much interaction you have with that if you want to go somewhere because you want a job right away say what is your job placement rates in the first you know three months after the program um and those are all very like valid things to ask um the other route is uh self-guided learning and um St stacy mentioned yesterday when we we're going through the slides that even if you choose this self guided learning route, you know, you want to make sure you have a plan beforehand. So it might not be a structured program like from from one of these like online courses or boot camps or college courses, but you still want to say, I want to learn these skills and this is my time period and make sure that you have a you have a goal for your your own uh, self guided program too. Um, so there's books, tutorials, blog posts, there's so much information out there right now. You can learn um, about like all of all of the data science topics. Um, so maybe do come up with your goal as to what you're interested in learning. Um, but but um, there is information out there. Like if you need to be studying, you know, after work or at odd or at um, maybe not the hours when some of these programs are available and so you need to do it on your own or maybe you work better um, on your own like this is prob this might be a good path for you um, so regardless of the path that you're that you um, go to learn these skills you will also need to demonstrate your ability to to use them so it's not enough to say I did this program or I graduated from this boot camp or I have this certificate or I, I read this book. Like you need to be able to show that you can use the the skills or the um, programs or um, whatever the 
the coursework was was teaching you. Um, so one way to demonstrate technical um, competency, um, showing that you can actually use those those skills, um, is through like website um, or GitHub portfolio, where you can just um, where you can share like projects that you've done. So these could be projects that you did in your course, but you can share the code. You can show the decisions that you made. You can show like how you're cleaning the data. You can even outline. Um, you can outline um you can um you can outline different assumptions or decisions that you made about the data um you can also give uh conference and meetup presentations so um i'm a meetup organizer we're always looking for people to give talks <laughs> at our events um so definitely if you learn some some skill um other people want to know about it. You might be like, oh, I'm just learning. Nobody nobody will care about this, but they they do care. Other people are at the same position that you are. And, um, and just sharing your learning process might be able to help other folks that, you know, they might want to do that too. And maybe some of your knowledge could, um, could, could help unstuck them. Yes, and hackathons are a great way to practice not only your technical competency, but also build your confidence. Um, in hackathons, in sort of a hackathon environment, you are typically placed in a group environment. So it's also a great way to practice those soft skills. You're given a problem that needs to be solved, and it's usually time bound. And so it often does a good job of stimulating or simulating what it might be to actually work on a real time project under, of course, a little bit more harsher conditions. Um, and then a, left, a third option that is lesser thought of is sort of blogging or posting newsletters about your experience. Don't be afraid to share your journey while you're actually learning. Uh, far too often people think about, think that they don't need to sort of share or post updates until they've mastered something when there can actually be great value in actually posting on LinkedIn or even creating medium posts as you're actually learning something. This not only helps to build your own confidence, it makes your own peer group aware and your own community aware of your journey, but also potential employers also could see this and reach out to you directly. So don't be afraid to sort of post about your learning journey while you're actually going through it. But remember that even with all of these on display, you're very likely to still have to do a technical assessment when it comes to the interview process. These won't absolve you from that, but at the very least, they should help you stand out in landing your first interview. So like we said, you're all starting from somewhere. So you're definitely, even though you're you're coming into your first data science job, you're not coming in with zero knowledge. So you know what you know. So making past experience, making past experience relevant is key. Um, so leaning on past domain knowledge, whatever whether that was whatever industries you worked in, if you volunteered before, you had past internships, all of this domain knowledge you know and has value. Um, and then also leaning on business expertise. Are you a subject matter expert in something else? Um, if you're a subject matter expert in something else, that's a lot of value that you can add to an organization. And so having that sort of subject matter, subject matter experience and then adding the data component can be really valuable and help you stand out in what might otherwise be a really crowded um, candidate pool. And then also lean on passion projects and volunteer experience. You don't have to necessarily be paid for something to have experience doing it. So if there's other side projects that you've worked on or that you're passionate about, you volunteer in organizations, even if you didn't get paid to do it, um, those experiences can add great value to what you can bring to an organization. So when you're um, considering getting your first data science job, you definitely want to think a lot about um, what jobs you're actually targeting. So we've kind of split these up into um, two different um, two different areas. One is identifying companies, and one is identifying roles. Um, so you might want to identify the companies based on a personal interest. So if you're really interested in cars, maybe you want to focus in the automotive industry. Or if you're maybe you're really interested in clean energy, and so you're going to focus on clean energy um, related companies. And don't be afraid to, um, you know, think broadly about these topics. So, you know, if you're really interested in, in cars and you're thinking about automotive industry, you can sort of also think about what are what are companies that are maybe, you know, 
related to an automotive industry, but not necessarily a car company. Um, and that will still get you close to what you're interested in, but it might not get you. Um, and it, it might open up more opportunities than, than you had originally considered. Um, you might be really interested in the mission. So like, is it a nonprofit? Is it working with government? Is it, um, is it um, working with children? Um, so, so something like that about a particular company might, um, might appeal to you specifically when you're looking for a role. And then um, also location versus remote. So that's one thing that's probably not going to change about a company. So when you're when you're identifying where to apply, you know you better and it's not a remote <laughs> company. You better make sure that it's somewhere you want to live, um, because they will probably have you relocate there. <laughs> um, so definitely think about the location of the company, or maybe you're only interested in remote. And so if you're only interested in remote companies, then you probably should not apply to um to roles that say this is an on-site role right so company size is also another factor you need to consider when identifying companies um most often when you're just entering the data field oftentimes people think about sort of medium to small size companies and that can be great but also keep in mind just sort of how that ramp up period how long that ramp up period is and how quickly you'll be expected to contribute um, often at bigger size companies, there's a there's a longer sort of lead time or ramp before you're expected to make an impact, which can, which should factor into the decision you make for the size company that you want to work with. Um, and then tech stack. Tech stack matters. Um, if you are somebody who you know knows R primarily for your scripting language, then you want to also target companies where R is sort of the primary scripting language that they use. If Python is not your strong suit, then target companies that don't sort of place as large of an emphasis on Python. Even when it comes to SQL and R versus Python, um, oftentimes in certain companies, certain di certain data scientists sort of have a more SQL heavy focus and less on Python and less on R. And so you definitely want to target companies if SQL is your strong suit. Let's sort of emphasize that first. And the reverse is also true. There are also companies that have sort of a more Python and R heavy focus and not so much SQL. And so if those are your strong suits or where your interests lie, you definitely want to target companies that sort of lead with that first. And then when it comes to identifying roles, um, the first thing, again, is we talked a little bit earlier about warm contact. So what exactly is a warm contact? A warm contact is someone that you have some sort of connection with, whether you're part of the same alumni network, the same volunteer organizations, former co-workers, or maybe they're even a secondary or tertiary connection for you on LinkedIn. The idea being is that you want to target jobs and identify roles where you have some connection or you have someone possibly there who you can lean on to get more information or who could potentially refer you. Now, if you don't have any warm contacts, but you see a job that you're interested in or a role that you want to apply for, it's okay. I always recommend doing what I like to call sort of warming up cold contacts. And that can come from sending them a message, introducing yourself, telling them a little bit about why you want to work in this role, and then also what value you believe you can add. It's important to remember when reaching out to people and trying to warm them up that you don't use this time to sort of read your whole biography to them. If they don't know you, they're, they're not going to have time to sort of read through a five page, five paragraph email. So it's important to be concise, get to the point, but also make sure you talk about what value you can add to them. Um, and then networking. Um, so for most of us, we often have been taught to think about networking as sort of this blind experiment where you introduce yourself to random people you don't know and then tell them things that you want from them. Um, and that is not the way that either Wendy or I would recommend you network. Uh, think about networking as sort of really making genuine human connections, right? That's based around mutual interests, similar passions, but most importantly, that's based around mutual benefit. And so I often like to share the story of how Wendy and I met. So Wendy and I actually met on Twitter. And interestingly enough, we have not even met in person, um, but it was a genuine human connection that connected us. She was gracious enough as I was early looking for my first job in data science. She hopped in a Zoom call. She offered me guidance based on her own experience. I do want to note that at no point during that initial Zoom call did I ask her if she could get me a job. I didn't even ask her if she could give me a referral. Um, I was listening to the guidance that she offered and just shared what my experience had been like. And over time, we continued to stay connected. When I did land my first job, she was, you know, she reached out, she congratulated me, and we've stayed connected that way. But again, it's based on it was based on a genuine human connection that just happened to take place over Twitter. Um, and then I also want to talk about sort of contract versus full-time work. Sometimes when we see the word contract and jobs, we initially get nervous and think that that's not a good fit. 
Contract work can actually be a great way to get your foot in the door at a company, especially if it's a bigger company that a lot of people want to work at. Sometimes it can be hard to stand out among a pool of other applicants. And so contract work can be a great way to do that. It's sort of like a prove it first model. And if you can prove that you're a good fit, that you can that you can perform the job, then oftentimes the full time job offer will soon follow. And so I don't want you to be discouraged when you see contract opportunities. If you see one at a company that fits um, and meets the other needs that you have, then I definitely think contract work is something you should keep in mind. And so one other thing to think about when you're looking at the roles is the job title. So if you remember in Stacy's uh, journey, one of her goal was to have the job title data scientist. So if that's your goal is to have the job title data scientist, then obviously you want to look for roles that are data scientists. But if you're just trying to get a job in data science, there's lots of other job titles to look for. Um, such as data analyst, uh, data visualization engineer, um, or analytics engineer is a new one that's kind of like at the interface of data engineer and data science. Um, and so don't you don't have to just be focused on, on the job title unless that's your specific goal. And if so, if that's your specific goal, then definitely do be focused on job title. Um, then I wanna talk a little bit about online job ads. Um, so definitely when you hear people give talks about how to get a job. It's all about networking, talking to people. And there's there's generally a don't just apply randomly to jobs online. Um, so I'm kind of the exception to the rule. And I've gotten a lot of the jobs that I have had in my career by just randomly applying to them online. Um, so I want to speak a little bit to that and give you um, some, some ideas if that's the route you're going to go. If like you don't have any warm contacts, like like Stacey mentioned, then um, then and you see a job ad that calls to you and like there's a reason that you're interested in this job based on how the job ad was written, then definitely still apply to it. But but take the time to mention why you were interested in the job in your application. Um, so if that's in your cover letter, then say, you know, this role really spoke to me because of X that I saw in your in your job ad and really make it seem that you have something to contribute and this job would be a good fit for you and why. So I'm not saying if you're gonna go out and apply for 100 jobs from random internet jobs that you should do that for all of them. You shouldn't make something up that's disingenuous, but if something speaks to you, mention it and it definitely comes across to either the recruiter or the hiring managers um, that you took the time to to read and focus on what they're, what they're after and, and why that would work for you. Um, I will also say that um, online job ads come in many different forms, and so um, definitely look at the job ad. Um, don't just say like, oh, this is a junior data scientist position, I'm going to apply to it. You know, you want to you want to look at it and see how it matches your targets, how it matches your goals. Like, is it a big company? Is it a small company? Can I see from this job ad, am I going to be part of a team or am I going to be the only data scientist here? And so really take the time to try to understand the role and not just understand the title. And so once you've found these jobs that you're applying to, um, either through contacts, through networking, um, through job ads, then there's the interview process. Um, and so just a reminder that there's two parts to the, to the job interview. So first part is the interview process, or I've called it here, their interview process. So this is kind of like, first there'll be an initial call, there's a hiring manager, they wanna know that you're a good you have a good alignment for, for the role. Um, you have the skills or you have the experience or you have uh, genuine interest in the role or the company and that your compensation expectations match what they want to pay for this role. Um, and after that, there'll probably be a technical assessment. This is just saying, do you know the skills that you put on your resume? And this could be like live coding, uh, take home or time test. Um, and so if it's live coding or take home, then in addition to seeing that you know the skills, it's also that they can see like how you're thinking through the process of the, of the problems and how you can troubleshoot and how you can communicate that um, along the way. I always suggest when folks are doing technical screens to talk things out, like it sounds weird, but say like, I'm going to join this 
to this table to this table because I need this information that's in this table and this, you know, just talk it out so that they can really understand um, the thought process that you're you're doing when you're doing your work. Um, and then after the technical assessment, there'll be a loop. And so that's like with multiple people, they could be people from the team, they could be the hiring manager again, and then they can also be like stakeholders that you would work with. Um, and so they, on the loop, there's also some behavioral and situational questions, and there could be more technical questions. And then there's also a chance for, for um, them to see how you interact with stakeholders. The second side of the interview process is actually your interview process. And these are the things that sort of you want to make sure you get out of the interview. So to prepare, you definitely want to practice. Practice your technical skills, practice your behavior questions. And I'm a huge fan of doing mock interviews, just sort of going through the habit of, of getting the repetitions in and getting comfortable owning your narrative adds a lot of value. In preparing for the actual interview, you want to look up people who are in that loop. Um, understand sort of what they're not only what their job title is, but how do they interface and interact in the role that you're applying to fill. Um, and then you want to have answers to common questions like, tell me about yourself. Um, this should be the time for, for you to give your elevator pitch and for you to really sell yourself and, and sort of highlight the things that may not necessarily jump off the page at, of your resume. And then lastly, you always want to have questions, questions about the team, the role, company culture, the things that matter to you, making sure you understand what their expectations are and what the success look like in this role. Also questions about the onboarding. One word of caution, though, you don't want to use this time to ask questions that are you can easily find out online. This is your chance to really dig deep and to ask questions that you can only get answers from from them. And so any answers that you can easily Google or that can easily be found online, you don't want to ask those during this process. And so a couple things to consider. Remember that it is hard to get your first job in data science. And this is an, indeed a challenging economic climate. Um, there's obviously been a ton of tech layoffs lately. But remember to please be kind to yourself, be patient, and give yourself a ton of grace. Um, as both Wendy and I can testify to, that your first job in data science will not be your last job. So even if the first place you get an offer from is not sort of your dream company and the company that you always wanted to work for, it does not mean that you can't one day work there. So now we invite you to, to you know, we, we've left this, this blank. So what's, what's your journey? So you might want to say, like, what's your goal? You know, what's your starting point? You know where your starting point is. And hopefully you know what your goal is. And so you can take an assessment of, like, what are the relevant skills you have? Are those the, are those the skills you, have, you, ha you need for that goal? Or maybe you need to, like, learn some more things. Um, what's your current knowledge? And then take some time and think about, you know, what are your job targets? How are you going to find those job targets? How are you going to um, meet people that are at those companies that you're interested in? Are you interested in full-time work? Are you interested in contract work? Um, and then um, when the time comes and you get these interviews, which you will, um, what are you trying to get out of the interview process? Um, and, and this is just for your first job. And all these things can change as you move throughout your data career. So yes. we'd, we'd, we'd love to take questions. Um, I will say that there's one more slide in the slide deck um, that has some resources. Um, this, is not, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just folks that, um, that I follow or Stacy follows um, as far as um, uh, career coaching and transitioning. So they give a lot of advice about um, about interview um, interview preparation or like certificate opportunities, scholarship opportunities. Um, I've listed a few data scientists that I follow on Twitter. Um, there's a lot of data scientists on Twitter. Um, the data community on Twitter, um, I think, has been really instrumental in my career, definitely. Um, and then I put a link down to um, to um, David. He has set up data on Mastodon, so you can find that through his Twitter. Um, and then meetups and communities. Um, so the ones that I've listed are all very focused on like uh, women in tech, because um, that's the background that I have. But there there are communities out there for everybody. Um, and like in PyLadies, anybody is welcome, um, not just women. And um, 
And I think those communities are great because they allow you to like have a support system when you're going through this, you know, trying to find your first job is really hard. And so having people out there to like help you answer questions or to celebrate with you when you get your job, um, that's always, that's always really good. All right, so I'll, I'll read the first question that I see in the chat. Um, and it says, so can you both address more about the process a career transitioner might go through the transition process from a non-technical field background, especially one where it may be difficult to include data science projects in their work? Um, so I'll start and then Wendy, if you if you want to add something to that, you can. So I think this is a great question. Um, for one, when you're transitioning from when you're transitioning to the data science from a sort of unrelated or non-tech field, um, it may not be as simple as sort of going to your boss and saying, hey, can I start working on some data science projects? If you have that option, by all means. But if you don't have that option, I think a lot of your training may come from sort of outside work projects. And so that may be finding projects online, joining other communities where you can get exposure and experience. And, and not only developing those skills, but then having chances to practice and implement those skills. And when it comes to the work that you actually do, so maybe you can't necessarily formally um, be included in data science projects or certainly incorporate data science into the things you do, but any information you can gain at work. And so one common thing that I often tell people to start with is just understanding what is the tech stack your job uses if they have one. Um, so small things like that, understanding just how you can sort of connect the dots between the things that you're learning and how they're actually applied in industry, I think could be incredibly valuable. Um, I agree. I think it's important to share with um, with folks that you're on this journey. Um, sometimes if you don't have the confidence to like volunteer yourself, you're like, oh, I don't I know Python, but I don't really know Python. But other other people might say, oh, Wendy knows Python. You know, she talks about going to PyLadies or or these classes that she's taken and they'll just volunteer you. Like that literally happened to me when I was um, trying to get my first data job. Uh, I, um, I, I decided I was going to get a data job in tech, but I didn't really believe that I could. And then um, one of our, one of my friends from college asked um asked a bunch of people like does anyone know python and i was like i'm sure someone knows python more than me because he needed help with something and my friend was like wendy knows python she'll help you and so um i was i like went and i did this project with him on um that used python and um and um i was like oh i i i can do this i i i have the ability to do this um i think that depending on where you are it might be more or less easy to to get into data um but even if you can't work directly with the data you can still talk to the folks at your job about how data is used at your company oh you're on mute stacy sorry thank you all right, so next question. Would you say more data science roles, especially entry level since I'll be a recent graduate are more remote or in person? I think that largely depends on where sort of geographically you're, you're targeting to work and then also sort of the industry that you're targeting to work. Um, speaking from just sort of a tech background, a lot of tech roles are remote and I think that extends both for entry level as well as more senior roles. But I think other industries that may vary and again, depending on where in the country you're looking for work, it could vary. One other thing that I will add though, I do think in the beginning of your career, there can be great value though working um, in a more in-person or hybrid role just because you get a chance to learn a little bit more and interact. I think in a way that remote doesn't often afford you. So I think there is great value when you're starting out to sort of be in a more in-person environment. I agree. <laughs> okay, another question is, um, can you explain more on the technical assessments you have experienced coming from a non-technical background? This actually worries me. Sure. And, and I will just say I personally relate to just being nervous about the technical assessments. Um, you know, when you go, when you're, when you're learning and, you know, on your own, even if you go through like a traditional or structured boot camp, it's often you're, you're still kind of unsure. Do I know enough? Am I ready for that first role? And so I, I do definitely relate to just the feeling of being a little uneasy and nervous. 
my technical assessments range from take home assignments, which were fairly fairly easy given that you sort of had time to think about them. It definitely helped taking the pressure off. So the take home assignments were, were not overly challenging that I felt like it was something that I couldn't tackle. And again, it helped ease the pressure a little bit that I could work on it independently. I also did sort of regular technical screenings, both for SQL and Python. Um, and these were typically two to three questions, just depending on the time, medium level difficulty. Um, but it was often live coding. And these, I, I always highly recommend that you, one, articulate and so you communicate a lot with the person interviewing you so that you just can make sure you are understanding the question well, that you ask a lot of questions if you don't understand. And then lastly, remember, whoever's interviewing you, they are there to help you and they want you to win. They're not there to trip you up and to try to confuse you. They're there as a resource and an asset. So not to fear, if you have questions that come up, if there's something you need clarity on, if there's something you're not understanding, be sure to ask questions, talk through it as you're doing it, um, and you'll be fine. I think you'll be fine. Yeah, I agree. I've had um, I've had some like time tests. Um, those, I think the timed tests are the hardest ones because there's not a person on the other side. Um, so uh, where like if you run into trouble, if you don't understand the question, then um, you just have to keep working at it and hope that you'll get the right answer. Um, and then take homes, um, which vary a lot as to how much how much um, you have to do. So I've had ones where it's just a, um, like just a, a few SQL problems, but then like also like analyze this data and come up with this presentation to answer these four questions. And um, so sometimes they take a lot of time and they'll, they'll like tell you this should take four hours and it actually takes you like 12 hours. Um, but that happens to everybody. So don't think like, oh my gosh, I, I'm not able to do this job because it takes me three times as long. Um, they are vastly underestimating the amount of time it will take you to do these. Um, and the live coding, I enjoy the live coding ones the most, but I think that's because I enjoy the interaction and under like being able to ask and clarify, like what are we actually after? Um, I think it's I think it's most helpful when the um, it always gives me a, a positive um, a positive feeling about the company when the technical assessment is like relevant to the work that the role has. So if they're like give you some like off the wall SQL um, problem and they want you to write a um, a presentation about it and it's just totally um, about different data than they use at the company and that to me is always questionable. Got you. Okay, next question. I've noticed a lot of jobs that desire someone with a master's degree or three to five years of experience. Is the cost of master's in data science worth it for that level, uh, for that level of applications, or can I get more market, can I get and market those skills through self-learning effectively? So I'll speak from my experience because I don't have a graduate um, degree, and so I 100% would would say that it is possible to land a, a job in data science without having a mark a advanced degree such as a master's. Um, for me, when I was sort of at that crossroad between wanting to get into data science and contemplating, was I going to go back to graduate school um, or was I going to go the boot camp route? One of the things that I personally weighed was just cost and time. I didn't necessarily want to go through a one to two year program that was going to cost a lot of money um, just to then start job searching. And so I think it's certainly possible. Again, my own experience has been that it is possible to be able to not have a master's degree and still land a job. But I do think in absence of that, um, you do have to through some of the things that we talked about, do have to sort of demonstrate your ability and your competency in some of the core skills. But I don't think you have to have a master's degree, no. Yeah, I agree. I don't think you have to have a master's degree. Um, I think some of the jobs that ask for some of that experience level or a degree, um, they might are they might be asking for a specific type of data science experience and so if the job is asking for a specific type of data science experience like it's a marketing data science position and they're asking for three years of marketing data experience like that's probably going to be required but if it's just a um if it's not a specific field or if there's not like an obvious reason 
for the for the job requiring that and it just they're just looking for more senior candidates um that might also um that might also tell you a little bit about you know how much effort they or how much um resources they have to help onboard someone so if they're only advertising for folks with experience, then it could be possible that they don't have a lot of resources for onboarding or mentorship. Um, but um, but yeah, I think if you can demonstrate the skills, if you have the relevant experience aside from the three to five years experience, then you don't need a master's. Um, reasons why you might want to get a master's are um, you do want to you know, level up in specific areas. You want the opportunity to get an internship that might come with being a master's student. Um, or you might want a, like to be part of an alumni network or um, they might have some kind of job placement help if you're part of their program because they want to say that their program helps place folks in jobs. Nice. Okay, next question. What do you mean by knowing Python? Is it through CS data structures? Um, so in the context of, of what we've been talking about here, when we talk about knowing Python, um, so Python is a, a programming scripting language. And so when we talk about knowing it, it's really just your proficiency with it. Um, data structure, CS data structure. So data structures is not necessarily a language, um, but in, instead it's more of a concept. And so when I talk about knowing Python, it's specifically sort of your understanding and competency in Python as a scripting language. Yeah, we're not talking, or I'm not talking about writing production level code in Python, like object oriented programming or anything like that. I'm talking about being able to manipulate data in Python, um, possibly understanding common data science libraries and packages. Um, that exists in Python. Um, so like pandas, like they said, there's a webinar coming up on pandas. Like you should probably know pandas if you're going to be a data scientist um, at a place that uses Python. But I, yeah, I'm, we're not, I, I'm not a computer scientist, um, but I use Python regularly at my work. Agreed. Okay, next question. What are the best strategies, recommendations to practice interview questions that are most similar to questions that you've encountered? Um, so for this, I would say if possible, this is why I really love mock interviews. If you can find somebody who works in a data field, whether it's a data analyst, data scientist, or even someone who you know may maybe works in HR and interviews for technical roles, who can you know, do mock interviews with you, I would say that's always a great way to practice. In the absence of having sort of an industry professional who you can practice with, um, there's some great sites um, that you might find and some of the resources that we provided who provide great sample questions uh, for data science questions and interviews that I would say, look at those. Um, and you can practice those either by yourself or even if you have another peer who doesn't necessarily work in industry, but can ask those questions with you. Um, and then lastly, I would also say, um, really owning your narrative. So a lot of landing your first job, especially if you're a career transitioner or you come from sort of a non-traditional background, is being able to help the interviewer see just sort of how you have skills and experiences that are relevant that may not jump off the page of your resume. And so really being able to be good at sort of owning your narrative, owning your story, um, and then the behavioral questions, I feel like is really, really important. Yeah, I think it's... Um it's cool to take um, some experiences or like anecdotes or stories um, about um, some of these that are related to some of these um, common questions. Like you can find a lot of common interview questions online. And so go through your resume or go through your volunteer experience or go through your coursework projects and um, come up with stories of like, here was a situation I encountered. Here was what I, here was the task. Here is what I did as a part of my team. And here was the result. And practice like having, you can have like, you know, five or 10 stories that you can use in that structure to answer almost any kind of um, common job interview question. So that, I mean, that's what I did when I was doing a lot of job interviews. I like, went through my experience said these are the six or eight stories I want to talk about. Let me apply them to each of these questions. 
That was great advice. Um, one question that I want to make sure we get to, which is what is the best strategy of getting an internship for an international student with the majority of companies screening if applicant requires visa sponsorship? Um, short disclaimer that I, I know that we do want to call out is that obviously our presentation focused on landing a job in the U.S. Um, and so this doesn't necessarily apply if you're looking to land a job outside of the U.S. But for this question for international students who are hoping to get a job within companies um, within the U.S., um, I do realize that this journey is sort of a, you have a bit more of a, a hill to mount with this. Um, and my best advice, obviously, is to target companies that specifically do hire or do offer visa sponsorships. Um, I do know some, um, I don't know if they're included in the resources that we provided, um, but I do know that there are websites and sort of lists that you can find of companies that, that you can specifically target. So I would say start with those. I would say tap into, you know, alumni networks if you can, which are usually good resources also for companies that would help with visa sponsorships and things like that. Wendy? Yeah, I'm not super familiar with this area, but I would say, I would say ask, like, maybe pose this more to people that have that experience. I'm not that familiar with this. Yeah, sorry we couldn't be more helpful. Um, next question, would you recommend applying and taking a job, asking for Excel skills, and then helping the company usually start up, small startup transition over to Python or R? Uh, for me, that's absolutely. I always think that there is great value when you can add value to a company. And I think that it goes a long way. I'm um, just getting your foot in the door. And so if that is with Excel skills, especially if you have a strong background in that, I think it's always easier to get your foot in the door and then add value in the place. So I would absolutely recommend that. I a hundred percent agree. Um, actually the first, the first position that I had, um, the data team I joined did not use Python and they were they primarily use SQL and then they would put the data they got from SQL in Excel. Um, and when I got there, like we all moved over to Python and um, some of my teammates were like really excited about it. And um, they moved on to be like data scientists at like <laughs> other like really big companies. And they were like, Wendy, we didn't even know this was possible. You saved us like two weeks of time. Um, by sharing like Python with us um, and then yeah it made our it also made our team really popular like lots of people wanted to join our team after we switched over to using Python so um, definitely if you if you have a new skill that you can bring um, don't be don't be afraid to share it. even if it's your first job you know um, like we said you know have that confidence to say let's try this let's do this for sure. Um, okay, another question, which I think is a really good question. What is the average number of job interviews for first-time seekers to go through before getting a job? Um, and so I want to try to sort of provide like my entire funnel before I landed my first job. I probably put in close to 70 or so applications, uh, which probably led to less than 10 interviews. I can't remember the exact number, but less than 10 interviews and then two offers. Um, now I did come from an online data program. And so there was sort of a career component to that. So they provided us direct access to partner companies. Um, and so that also was a benefit, but yeah, so I probably had put in close to 70 applications, which led to less than 10 interviews. Um, and then I, I had two job offers when I finally made the selection that I did. Um, I don't remember how many jobs <laughs> I applied to or how many interviews that I had. Um, I will say that when I had the interview for the position that I ended up taking as my first job, like, it was very obvious to me that, like, that was, that was the right job for me. Um, and so I, I think that, um, don't, maybe don't keep going on job interviews or don't, um, I mean, definitely keep going on job interviews until you have an offer, um, but don't be afraid to be like, this place is not right for me, or oh, this place is definitely right for me. Um, trust your gut. Um, I have I have no memory of how many job jobs I applied for. <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> um, and the last question that I see in the chat, I'm not sure if there's more, but the last question in the Q&A section is, what are good ways to filter out the Excel jobs versus the R slash Python jobs? Um, 
if I understand this question correctly, I think a big part of that comes down to the job description. Hopefully in the job description, companies are listing out sort of what are the core skills that they're looking for that are required for the job. So if Excel is one of them, then it should state that. If Python or R is one of them, then they should also state that. In the absence of either company stating that, you can sort of read other things about the job description, the type of work you'll be doing, um, whether things like you'll be automating a process um, or other clues that might clue you in or sort of the type of tools you'll need to do that job. Um, and if you're still unsure and it actually gets to sort of that first round um, in terms of you talking with the hiring manager, I would certainly ask the question directly, just so you're aware. I agree. Great, okay. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions that we missed. I want to make sure we, we um, touched on every question that we missed. Um, but I think I think if there's no more questions, I think I think that's that's all for us. Hey, Wendy and Stacy, thank you so much. Um, if you if, if you don't mind repeating how people can get in touch with you, that would be great. Uh, sure. I'm on. I'm on Twitter still. My handle is wgrus, just my first initial and last name. And then you can also find me on uh, LinkedIn. I'm happy to take questions either spot um, or just tell me. You know, send me a message and say, "Hey, I got my first data science job." That's always exciting to me. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm on Twitter as well. Uh, my handle is house, H-O-U-S-E, of, and then Swill, S-W-I-L. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, you can search by my name, Stacy Williams. Um, but yeah, you can find me there. And like Wendy, if you have any questions or want to message me or just want to connect, feel free to connect with me in either of those places. Okay. So, uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, thank you both so much uh, for your presentation. Particularly, I know it's it started at 9 a.m. Seattle time, so pretty er pretty early, and also on a weekday. And I, I know you're probably taking time away from work to do this. So thank you so very much. Uh, we will have the recording up usually within 24 hours. Um, yeah. Again, thank you very much, and uh, we will be in touch. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks Bye. Thanks for having everybody. us. Bye.